Hello again, friends. Today I'm going to explain how we can create a form using HTML. To create a form, we'll need a pair of form tags. The opening form tag has a few attributes we need to fill in. First is an action attribute. After submitting our form, to what location do we want to send our form to? Form submission is done with a backend language such as PHP. You might see a file name such as index.php or action page or something of that nature within your action attribute. We're not actually going to do a form submission, but just be aware that the action attribute sends data to this location, to this file. The file listed really can be anything, but that's outside the scope of this lesson. You'll also see a method. The method attribute specifies if this is a get request or a post request. Post is used for confidential information, such as a username and a password. Get is for insensitive data, basically. Again, this is outside the scope of HTML at this point in time. If we have a form and we're sending sensitive data, we should use post. Now let's create some elements within our form. The first thing we'll create is a text box. We need a self-closing input tag. So here's our text box. By default, the type is a text box but we can specify that with the type. So type text. There's other different types like passwords, emails, telephone numbers. We'll cover that pretty soon. We have a text box, but if a user sees this text box, they probably don't know what they should enter in. Let's add a label to the text box. Preceding my input tag, I will create a pair of label tags. What do we want our label to say? Maybe username. We're telling the user, hey, we want you to enter in your username. If somebody is using a screen reader, if they're visually impaired, we should add a for attribute. What is this for? Well, this is for my username. Another benefit of adding the for attribute to a label, when you click on the label, your cursor will move to the text box, but we need a matching ID attribute within the input tag. So the ID is going to be the same as the for attribute. Then when I click on the label, our cursor moves to the text box. There are a few other attributes you might be interested in as well. But before we get to that, we should create a submit button to submit our data. At the end of our form, we'll create an input tag. The type will be submit. It's a submit button, but it currently doesn't do anything. We're not using a backend language to submit form data to. There are some useful attributes for text boxes. Within the input element for our text box, let's add the required attribute. In order to submit this form, we need to type in a password. If I just leave it blank, then hit submit, we have this little prompt. Please fill out this field. I can't submit this form until I type in something. Then I can submit it. You could set a minimum and maximum length. That's another attribute. Min length equals then some length. The minimum length for a username is six characters. Let's type in just three or some other number below six, submit. Please lengthen this text to six characters or more. I'll come up with a different username, then submit, and that appears to work. You also have the capability of setting a maximum length with the max length attribute. Let's make the max length 15 characters. So let's type in a username. I'll add a bunch of characters afterwards. So I can type in any more than 15 characters. There's a maximum. To reset your form, there's a reset button. Let's copy this input tag, paste it, then change type to reset. So here's my reset button. I'll type in a username, press reset. Then we can reset the data for our form. But afterwards, I'm just going to add a break line just to put the submit button on a new line. With text boxes, you can add a placeholder to give the user an idea of what we want them to enter in and in what format. I'm going to add a placeholder attribute. What do we want our placeholder to be? Um, I don't know, SpongeBob SquarePants or maybe just SpongeBob. So the placeholder is faded. It gives a hint to the user as to the format in which they should enter in information. If I were to click on this text box, the hint is still there until we type in something. Okay, let's cover passwords. To create a password, we'll use an input tag. The type is going to be password. 
we should probably add a label to let the user know that we would like a password. So I'm just gonna copy the label that we have for our username. The for attribute of our label should match the ID attribute of our input tag. So the ID is going to be password. The for attribute of the label will be password. And then change the text to, there we are. I'm just gonna change one thing. After my password, I'm gonna add a break line. So I will add that here. All right, so with the password, the text is hidden. I can type in a bunch of characters and you can't see it. You could add some of these attributes as well, like a minimum length, maximum length, and the required attribute. So I'll copy those and paste them within the input tag for my password. I can type in a username. If I attempt to submit this form data without a password, we have that prompt, please fill out this field. That's because we have the required attribute set. There's also a minimum length and a maximum length set too. I'm required to type in a password that's at least six characters long. Right now, this is only five. Anything between six and 15 is okay. For the rest of this demonstration, I'm going to get rid of these attributes. Let's cover email next. I'll create a label first. This will be for email. The text will be email. Then we'll need a corresponding input tag. Input type equals email. For the ID, I will also set that to be email. I'll add a line break after. Then I'll add a placeholder. S square pants at gmail.com. Again, the placeholder is letting the user know the format in which they should type in their information. If I were to type in some text, but we're missing that at sign. Hold on, let me type in something real quick. All right, click submit. We have a prompt, please include an at sign in the email address because we're looking for a valid email address format. That's input for email. Let's copy our label for phone. The text will be phone number. Again, we need an input tag. The type will be TEL for telephone. We need a matching ID that matches the for attribute. Phone, I'll add a break element to the end. We can type in a phone number. I'll add a placeholder too. Placeholder equals, with American telephone numbers, you have three digits, such as one, two, three, dash, then another three digits like four, five, six, dash, then four digits, seven, eight, nine, zero. So currently we can type in any numbers, then submit them. Uh, hold on, I need a username. We can limit the format in which a user can type in some numbers for a phone number. We would need a pattern attribute. For the digits zero through nine, within a set of straight brackets, you would type zero dash nine. Then how many digits do you allow afterwards? Three. Then we'll need a dash that's required, add a dash. Then another three digits, zero through nine, zero dash nine. Then another three digits, dash, number zero through nine. Let me move this in a little bit. Then I would like four digits. So now our phone number needs to be in this format. Three digits, dash, three digits, dash, four digits. One, two, three, dash, four, five, six, dash, seven, eight, nine, zero. Hold on, I'm gonna get rid of this required attribute just because it's kind of annoying right now. One, two, three, dash, four, five, six, dash, seven, eight, nine, zero. There, that seems to work. But if I were to type in a random amount of numbers, well then we don't meet this pattern. Matching this pattern is required in order to submit this data. All right, then we have dates, like a birth date. We'll need a label. This will be for a birth date. For B day, input type equals date. The ID should match the for attribute of the label. Then I'll add a break element. So with dates, there's an interactive calendar to select a date. Pretty simple. Then we have a number element. A user is going to enter in a quantity, like they're buying something. Like how many do you want? Let's change the text to quantity for quantity. 
We need an input element. The type will be number. ID equals quantity. Then I'll add a break. So here's our quantity. We can use these arrows to go up or down. However, normally you can go into negative numbers. We can set a minimum and a maximum with the min and max attributes. So the minimum will be zero. We don't want to go below zero. The max, I think 99 is good. So we can't go below zero, but we can go all the way to 99 and no further. You can add a default value with the value attribute. I'll set the default to be one. That is for number input. It's good if you need a quantity of something. All right, then radio buttons. Radio buttons are a little tricky. With radio buttons, you can only select one from a group. I think a good label will be for a title. Are you a mister, a miss, a doctor, whatever. Like, what's your title? So title for title. We have our title so far. Then we'll need individual buttons. I'll create a label for mister, miss, and doctor. Mr. Miss. In the US, doctor is P H D. The for attribute will be Mr. for Mr. Miss for Miss. Then P H D for PhD. I'm going to get rid of these colons. So after each label, we'll create a radio button. Input type equals radio. The ID will match the for attribute of the label. We have Mr. Then we'll want to add a value to when we submit this form. So Mr. Okay, let's copy this input, then apply it to Miss and PhD. So type radio, ID will be Miss, value Miss. Then we have PhD, ID will be PhD, value PhD. So we have three radio buttons. Um, let me just add a break afterwards. With a group of radio buttons, you should only be able to select one. However, we can select all three. That's because we need to add all of these radio buttons to the same group. We're going to add a name attribute. We'll name this attribute title. Whichever radio buttons you would like in the same group, they need to share the same title. Now we only can select one. Those are radio buttons. Okay, let's create a drop down menu. This will be for a payment. Like, what kind of card are you paying with? Is it a Visa card, MasterCard, gift card? For payment. Instead of an input element, we're going to be using a pair of select tags for a select element. Then add a break afterwards. So we have a drop down menu, but there's no options. We will add option elements within our select element. So these have opening and closing tags. Let's create three options. An option for Visa, MasterCard, then gift card. For option one, the value will be Visa. The text will be Visa. So we have one option. Let's add two more. Value, MasterCard. The text will be MasterCard. Then a gift card. Value equals gift card. The text will be gift card. Then I forgot to add an ID to the opening select element. ID equals payment. There we are. All right, so that is a drop down menu. You need a pair of select tags. Within the select tags, you can create option tags. Then we have a checkbox. Again, let's create a label. This will be for a checkbox. I think a good use of a checkbox will be a subscribe button. The for attribute will be subscribe. The text will be subscribe. We'll need an input element. Input type equals checkbox. The ID will match the for attribute of the label. Then add a break element after. I can subscribe by checking the checkbox or by clicking on the label. This one's a little tricky. We're going to create a text area. Again, we'll need a label. 
the text next to the text area will be comment for comment. We'll create a pair of text area tags. So we have a text area. The ID of the text area will match the for attribute of the label. So comment. You can change the dimensions of your text box by adjusting the rows and columns. I would like three rows. Rows equals three. Columns, that will be 25. So now we have different dimensions for our comment. You can type in anything. You suck, bro code. That's how to create a text area. For a file submission, again, we'll create a label. We're kind of following the same pattern. File for file. Again, we need an input tag. Input type equals file. The ID will match the for attribute of the label file. Then I'll add a break. So now we can choose a file. However, by default, we can accept all files. To limit the type of file that you're looking for, there is an accept attribute. What file types will we accept? Let's do an image. For a PNG, that would be image slash PNG. When I choose a file, we're looking for a PNG now. You can add more than one file type. Each file type is comma separated. Let's also look for any JPEGs. So that would be JPEG. So now we're looking for a bunch of files, anything within this range. Now, if you're sending a large amount of data, there's one change we'll make to the form. We're going to change the encryption type within the opening form tag. Let's say we're sending an image, and the image is a large file. So we will set the encryption type equal to be multi part slash form data. In simple terms, when we send our large amount of data, we'll break it into multiple parts. Then when all of that data is received, those multiple parts will be reassembled. It's a little more complicated than that, but at this level, that's all you need to know. So if you're sending a large file, such as an image, I would recommend changing the encryption type to multi-part slash form data. All right, everybody. So that's how to create a very basic form using HTML. It really doesn't look too pretty right now. You can always style it with CSS, which we'll be covering very soon. And well, yeah, that's how to create a form using HTML.